Our goal today really is to help you envision how small groups might uh, provide some relief towards some of the goals that you have um, for the remainder of the school year. My name is Andrew Schauber. I'm the Instruction and Technology Coach at Ingham Intermediate School District. I've been there since 2014. And prior to that, um, I spent most of a decade teaching secondary math, most recently uh, in Battle Creek at the high school level. And uh, basically, it's my job uh, to help teachers function with their technology in ways that maximizes the effectiveness on uh, their students to help them create as impactful and uh, powerful uh, learning experiences as they can in ways that are the most sustainable for them. And my name is Phil Booth. I'm an assistive technology consultant through Ingham ISD. I do service Lansing. Um, I and um, I used to teach in Lansing one of my first few years of teaching. I, I, I taught at Lansing Eastern with Andrew's father, Barry, if it, that dates anybody on our audience on there. So, Indeed. you know, so it, it's, uh, it's nice to be back and talking to Lansing people. Um, and I also want to kind of explain my role. My, I service Lansing as a AT consultant and, um, I, I work with uh, technology solutions for uh, for kids with disabilities. Um, I'm the retrofitter person that comes in when classes is already established, and we're finding that the student has um, the student has some definite needs and is struggling at that time. Um, my role currently is not very efficient doing that because you end up doing one on one, one at a time students. And um, I'm glad to be part of this day to, for training to start establishing maybe a more efficient way to using my services in Lansing. And we also got support in this. So you're gonna notice a little bit of, uh, probably a little bit of clunkiness uh, only because this was ordinarily, or ordinarily, this was originally a 90-minute presentation done by four people, not a one-hour presentation done by two. So um, we're we're trying to to make a couple changes on the fly here. But um, our support in this is Heidi Gaskin and Nicole Greider, who are literacy coaches at Ingham ISD. They were heavily involved in the development, and we want to make sure they get credit for the great work that they do. So during our time today, what we want you guys to think about, um, and you're going to get some opportunities to engage in the chat as well as to jot notes just for your own purposes, um, and you're welcome to do either one, is we want you to think about what goals you have for your students for the remainder of this school year. Um, and if that leads you to visioning out some things you may have as goals for the fall as well, then by all means, think about that as well. Um, and then as we go, I want you to think about how small groups could help you achieve these goals. Okay, so this is the, the sort of reality of the situation is that Phil and I are gonna talk in general with some anecdotal specifics and some ideas about how small groups have supported teachers in the past and what types of things they have as their strengths. One thing I know because I taught secondary and I've worked in a lot of, of high schools and middle schools over the last you know, six, seven years, is that a small grouping is not something that gets used a ton in the uh, secondary world. And, and, and I didn't use it when I taught, except for, for the, the thing where we're gonna group students into groups of threes or fours and give them a task and then we're all gonna come back and, and um, report out. Okay, that type of small grouping does, but that's a, dis, that's a certain type of small grouping as opposed to other types of small grouping that um, I think that we, maybe are, are missing some of the value of. And so I just wanna make a case for why that might be something that you may wanna consider. This tip sheet that sits here on slide three or four, Phil just put a link into the chat for it. So that's, that's full of resources. We've got a folder that's got more resources on it. There's clickable links all the way through this. We wanna make sure that you guys have all the information you need to make this uh, something that works in your classroom. This is absolutely not a one size fits all solution for everybody. And that's actually well in line with how small groups are gonna get talked about. And Phil's gonna unpack that a little bit more as we get going. So, okay, 
So let's let's talk about the challenge we're trying to explore here. Okay, um, the challenge is that students are not as consistently engaged uh, when they're not in the classroom. Okay, that sentence I believe is true. I believe a lot of people have observed this in a lot of different settings. That students remotely as a group are not as engaged as they were when that same group is in the classroom. That's certainly not true for every single individual student. And it's important to recognize that. But at the same time, a lot of teachers, particularly secondary teachers, um, are observing a lot of cameras off, are observing a lot of mics muted, are observing a lot of empty chat boxes, uh, are observing a lot of work that's not that's getting assigned but not returned. Um, and that's having a detrimental effect on student learning. As we all know, one of the simplest truths is that when that it, students learn better when they are actively engaged in the learning. Passive students don't learn as much as active students do. So the question is going to become, if that's, our, if that's the challenge we're trying to overcome, then how might small groups provide some opportunities to fix that? for some students. How can we use that as a mechanism to encourage more students to become active participants in class? So here's the guiding questions we're gonna talk about as we move on. What is the role of small groups, okay? And why would I consider using them? How can we best make use of opportunities for targeted instruction? And we're gonna talk about what that is as a broad category with specific things inside of it. How will I use data to guide my decisions? Of course, you know, the math teachers are in the, in the room uh, are not afraid of a little bit of data, but it doesn't always have to look numbersy. And then how do I put it all together? Once I get all these different ideas, what's it gonna look like when I bring it all together? So that's what we're gonna talk about today. So, so what is the role of small groups? Okay, so the first thing I want you to write down, either on your notepad or type it into a Google Doc or write it in the chat or however, but play along, is what roles might small groups play in your classroom? What role might they play? Now, I'll grant that I'm an idea guy. And so it's, it's very comfortable for me to be in the space where for a short time, I'm not going to worry about how I'm going to pull these moves off. If I say small groups might help me address foundational skills, that's not a bad answer. But if you think to yourself, yeah, but how would I do it? You might not write that answer. Don't worry about that right now. There'll be time to worry about that. And we're going to have to. But right now, just ideas. What role might they play? So jot that on your notepad or type it into your Google Doc. If you're feeling particularly brave and you want to throw your idea out for the whole group to think about, go ahead and toss it into the chat. We already have some uh, chat comments on here, Stu, too, saying that, um, this moved on me, um, the students and group work projects, brainstorming groups, jigsaws, you know, we can also look at, and there's another comment here, on giving students an opportunity to be the expert, um, looking at student leadership, peer um, critiques on, on things differentiated groups, reading groups, book clubs, projects, math practice games, specific skill strengthening. That's, uh, you know, we don't give that, uh, we'll, we'll touch on that. We don't give that enough time in our, just our one session too, to, to look at specifically those kind of things, but uh, target connection and skills, a way to get to know your students better and give them more individual help. It's that relationship building that once you've established it, it's amazing how much work comes out after that. Confidence booster. Yep, I have observed in my career teachers whose tech, like technical instructional skill set, is not that great, but their classes run surprisingly well, and their students learn surprisingly well because the relationships are so good. Like if like they like you wouldn't like some of what they do, the way they set up lessons and all that stuff, you know, isn't necessarily like straight out of Marzano, but the relationships are so good that the students are bought in, they're willing to play along, they ask a lot of questions because the conversation is so comfortable, and then the teacher is able to make adjustments as 
he or she goes and that kind of addresses some of the some of that the you know the the weakness in lesson design so it's like finding ways to establish good relationships with your students uh really does as phil puts it a lot of work comes out of that and kendra kendra is is saying too so brings out the uh, oh you guys are moving on me here um brings out the voice of those who are silent in large groups yep and in many ways, there's a common thread through all of those chat ideas, which is the students are going to be active. I'm going to use small groups because the students are more likely to be active. So, um, okay, so let's take a look at what we're talking about there, because obviously there's going to be trade offs. Now, there's one district I know, um, and I had a conversation with them and I recorded that conversation, so it's available for you in the tip sheet. Um, they are um, using small groups for basically all of their instruction like they're not they're not even really instructing large group all that much and um and part of the reason for that is that they found that if you take a class period so let's just use an hour because it makes the math easy um if you have 24 kids in one hour the way that they were observing it is that most of those kids were disengaged and so they we would spend an hour pushing content and most of the students wouldn't learn it okay so let's suppose that rather than rather than an hour for 24 kids, most of whom aren't learning it, we were to say, okay, we're only going to teach for a half hour then, but we're going to break the class in half. So now, rather than all students coming to second hour, half the students come to the first half of second hour, half the students come to second half of second hour, and I teach the same half hour lesson twice. Okay, what they observed was, well, the students were more likely to engage. And so that was a half hour better spent. Yes, you're only spending a half hour instruction, seven hour, but that half hour resulted in more learning than the hour did. Okay. Well, let's push that iteratively the next place. Let's break into the thirds. So now you got eight kids for 20 minutes. Could you teach as much to eight kids in 20 minutes if those kids were actively bought in than you could to 24 in an hour that weren't bought in? I'm not saying that that's an absolute yes or no. I'm saying though that that, that trade-off might prove valuable. And then as Malika says in the chat, which is very insightful, that if a student wanted to stick around and hear the presentation a second time, which I know there are some of you in the room who chose that option for us today, <laughs> and we allowed you to do that as a universal design mechanism. Now you've got, students that you're, you're building flexibility in, you're recognizing that students in smaller groups are more likely to actively engage. You're more likely to know all of them. They're more likely to know you, all of those things. What if I, what if I told you that for five, for five students, all of their cameras would be on, they'd all be willing to buy in and you had 15 minutes with them and they would do that every day for a week. What could you do with that 15 minutes? I don't know the answer to that. I don't know that that's a universal truth. I don't know that that's something that would apply to your situation, but I, I do know that these are the kinds of things that we think about as we go. So the role of small groups in a general sense, and this is just my opinion, right? This is one person's opinion based on what I've read and seen, is they're flexible, they apply to student need, and they're able to be applied across a variety of needs. They make Feedback rich conversational learning more efficient to do. Right? It's easier to have conversations in classes of eight than it is to have in classes of 38. This is true. Um, and they provide opportunities for more authentic assessment. Okay. And this is what some of you are saying in the chat as well. Right. They do a better, it's easier for us to uh, ascertain the struggle of a student if we're able to have this type of richer conversation with them. Now, the trade-off might mean that you only get to have that richer conversation for this much amount of time, but is that a trade-off worth having? That's something that we can, you can make a, a critical decision about. Um, now, as opposed to what, right? As opposed to whole group instruction. Now you, now, you guys don't necessarily have to play this as an either or because you've got that, that asynchronous drop-in time that obviously, well, it's not obvious to me, I had to be told. So um, pardon the misspeak, but um, 
I've heard that you're not able to to like mandate anything during that asynchronous time, but that doesn't mean you couldn't encourage or incentivize students to come in, schedule some things and say, hey, we're going to do some small group time from 1 to 145 for Algebra 1. Okay, I would encourage all of you to come and anybody who does will get this, whatever that is. I don't know what that means, but I'm just saying like find ways to encourage that. Now you've got students coming in in small groups. So, so the question is, um, why would we use whole group instruction, right? If I just said all these great things about small group, well, in reality, it's fairly efficient. It's an efficient way to disseminate information. And for the most part, most teachers have a lot of practice with it. So they do a pretty decent job. And also most students have a fair amount of practice learning in that way. So they're, they've got some routines built into that. And most subjects, especially as they get higher up in sophistication are geared toward learning in that way. So it, it's not a terrible fit for a decent chunk of our student population, but it's not a great fit for a lot of our student population. And as Phil is gonna get into here, um, when we get into the universal design piece, it, it is a predictively a bad fit, even in face-to-face -face settings for a, a fair chunk of our students. And so we, we're gonna have to do something to augment that anyway. So, um, so being able to have the, uh, a small group structure that we can lean on, even if it's a tool in the toolbox that we don't use all the time to address student needs when our whole group instruction is not effective for a specific type of, of excuse me, for a specific set of students or a specific type of content, um, is, is useful, like I said, whether we're dealing with remote learning or not. I, I definitely see coming from a special ed background, knowing that um, Lansing has 18% in special ed students and a little bit, and other districts in Ingham County are very similar to that. And after we've gone through this whole year of online learning, we have more than that with kids struggling academically and falling falling behind is we when we look at whole group instruction we have a teacher in front of somebody we the moment you step in front of them you've lost and have already lost a number of kids in your classroom so um i was kind of it's that special ed person to to i feel pretty strongly about that and and I wanted to start talking more about um, some of the things or opportunities, some of the four, four areas that are kind of big picture concepts that you may already be doing some of these things, but I wanted to introduce or have a start of have a discussion on how these things can be built into um, how you structure your classroom. Now, both Andrew and I, um, I work with a lot of technology and have examples with technology and how they can fit with what you're doing. But please don't think um, of, especially these um, examples that these four concepts that we were talking about is um, as technology concepts. These are lesson plans, um, unit plans, and how you can incorporate and have flexibility with the kids that you have that need these these kind of things so so what i want to talk about is universal design for learning differentiated instruction scaffolding and target instruction so um differentiated instruction or udl is based off of um uh, construction and architectural universal design for buildings and infrastructure where they're taking a look at when I'm building something, if I build in some universal pieces to this, all people could use this. Not that I would have to build in the stairs and that I've always had and then try to build something around it, which makes things much more expensive for people. And differentiated instruction, we would take a look at differentiated instruction and how breaking up the groups, we're looking at a need for the students and then modifying what we're doing in the classroom to meet that. And scaffolding and target instruction end up blending in with those, those two, um, two things. 
So, and that's back to, um, and I, I'll start referring to these things as UDL DIs. It's just easier to come off my tongue for that. But I wanted to um, first kind of give that UDL kind of piece to two things and look at, at this as, as a dinner party. So this weekend was a beautiful weekend. I had a nephew that had a birthday. So my mom had her family come over and have a dinner outside on Sunday. So we had three generations of people. So, um, and so you just envision that with your families and, and know that you're going to have different interests and in foods. You're gonna have different diets that people want to have. You're gonna have, um, different ages and different people eating different amounts of food and that place and have that look of the um, dinner party at the birthday party at the Booth family. Um, my mom had to kind of start to think about how she was going to do that. She could first, she could end up having, okay, we are just having this meal, this one meal, and then everyone's going to have to deal with it. Um, but that's not going to make the means of three generations of, of people at that dinner party. Um, it's similar to your classroom that you would have. You're getting up in front of a class and you're trying to just say, hey, this is what we have. It's a great way to get that information out. But the goal is for the kids to be able to do this independently and master the skills that you're trying to teach them. Take this slide is is a good way of taking a look at um, and if we keep that dinner party kind of theme to things is that first a differentiated instruction we are going to assess the kids in a certain way to figure out what their needs are and then I'm going to end up manipulating that class and and move those kids towards mastery. Now the UDL approach is I'm going to think ahead of time and be able to know that I have the right amount of food and, and different types of food on my table that will um, meet everybody's um, thing. So a differentiated approach, my mom calls everybody to find out what they want or what they need and then she meets, does that. On the UDL approach is my mom just has that toolbox or has the kitchen to be able to make some things with help of others to um, make diversify the, the meals to be able to have everybody having that. So think about meal time and then transcend that into your classroom and how we can be able to um, use those kind of concepts there. The next slide. Is, is pretty wordy slide, um, but it, what I want you to make sure you understand from this these slides is that um, that universal design for learning is, is we, a concept of the kids are not the ones that are broke, it's, it's the lesson that we have that's broke. And if we have some, um, be proactive in coming up with some flexibility or and building our toolbox of things that we have, um, universal design is a great concept to be able to, our framework to be thinking about when you're designing your lesson for things. Now, of course, Andrew and I would see some of this uh, technology we now have in our, as resources to be more, to have with the flexibility of those things, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a technology solution to it. And then differentiated instruction is, uh, I alluded to in the previous slide, is it's kind of like, we want to be able to fix the student, or we want to make sure we know where that baseline is to be able to improve the growth for that student to master the, the um, master what we're trying to teach the, all our kids in the classroom. So, in order to be able to do that, we need to be able to understand the concept of scaffolding. So if we're, we think of a construction site, we're building a wall, we need to create a scaffold. And our goal for scaffolding is to make the students independent with our tasks 
and be able to know and learn that new um, new skills and master those skills. So when we'll talk more about collecting the data, we understand who these kids are. We look at the zone of proximal development and understand how much scaffolding we need for that kid, that particular student. And you have you know, 30 kids in the classroom, you have 30, possibly a 30 different scaffolding going on. Um, that's why we're talking about small groups is to be able to make that more manageable. So if I make a scaffold, I'm building a wall and I add to that scaffold, build the wall a little bit higher, add to it again, build that wall, take the scaffolding away, the building, the wall stands on its own. And that's where we're getting that zone of proximal development. That goal is for students to be able to stand alone. So here's some quick examples that we have for scaffolding um, students with, um, you could have listening to recordings. Now, curriculums are coming out more and more with their own recordings um, and, and things uh, of, from the text, from the worksheets that that they are built into their, their curriculum. Echo reading, you know, a dyad reading thing too, working with a screw, with small groups and using these um, strategies, repeat reading. So you could end up um, having them listen to a recording of the book and then in the small group, be able to have that reread um, for, for students. And, you know, even high school kids love to be read to. So, you know, it's kind of a natural thing, you know, um, a comfort thing for, for people. The ramp up books is another example where you could have in a folder in your Google Drive for kids to take a look at a, um, different books that they could take a look at and, uh, and um, un understand more background information for the lessons that you're taking for us. Even adults like being read to. Like, <laughs> that's why podcasts and uh, audiobooks are such a big deal. Oh, yeah. Great example of that. Yeah. You know, you can find podcasts and segments of podcasts that you can link into however your Google Classroom or your document that you're sharing with the kids. Um, and I, I have some of those examples of those in my accommodations link in the, in the later down the, uh, the slide presentation. But in a, I can only give little justice to target instruction and how important that is for us and especially in differentiated instruction where we, we've uh, taken a look at what would kids need we've assessed those needs and this is a great example a simple example an elementary example but it helps us with with this i get you know, andrew gives an example of an old classroom grade book that you could do the same thing at the high school level or, or the middle school level look and this is uh, foundation skills of reading so does these students all have the skills that we need and then you can target these kids to be able to take them aside somehow some way um, and and address target instruction address these areas of need um, for these kids so we get to a uh, stop and jot point here now taking a look at those four different things, the UDL, differential instruction, kind of scaffolding things, target instruction, where does this fit with your current practice? And, you know, I know, I know we're, we're naming these things, but when you think back uh, what you're teaching kids, you, you can identify like, oh yeah, I am doing some UDL stuff with, my, with these kids. Oh yeah, I, I have the scaffolding going on with this group, but maybe I need to scaffold this a little bit more or a little bit longer with some of this other group kind of thing. So please think about these, jot these down on a piece of paper, um, share these with us in the chat, and um, we, um, we can discuss those a little bit more. From Sarah, often when I do small groups, breakout room, and similar activities to what we have been describing, some groups work well and others say they have no one else would talk or turn on their cameras. 
how can I encourage community when I'm not myself um, in the room with them? So I, I don't think that we, and Andrew can speak more, he does a nice job. We're not condoning having groups without an adult. Um, is we're kind of picturing the thinking how we can have, um, we can pull kids um, away for a certain time frame on things that, you know, um, when you're not having the group lesson on, on, on stuff. Yeah, you know, here, here's part of it is that like existing in a functional small group without a grown up and staying productive that's a skill. That's a series of skills. And not every kid has those skills or is, or maybe they have them, but they're not comfortable using them. Right. And, and so it's like, so the first step in a digital setting might be to only, yeah, exactly. Right. Exactly. Right. So like, so, so Brittany brings up a great point too. Right. So like when you break students into small groups in your classroom, and you can see me, I'm stepping back. I'm standing up right now. <laughs> so I'm trying to talk like it would be in a presentation. Um, you've got students who are over across the room, but they're not unattended. They're, you're there. You're still there. And they know you're still there. They can hear your voice. They, you can monitor what they're doing. You hear what they're saying, like to some degree at least, right? And so, so this notion of trying to take advantage of fully unattended uh small groups is putting a lot of trust in the students in ways that they may not be prepared for yet. And I'm not saying that they're devious, although some of them might be, and I'm not saying that they're going to, I'm just saying that they're, they're likely to be unproductive for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is they don't know how to self-manage a small group. And so there's a couple of ways that you may find valuable to do that. The first of them, as Phil was saying, is to simply not do groups that don't have a teacher in them at first. And so every time there's a small group, you're going to have the students like you would in guided practice. They're going to be there doing their thing. And you've got a task for them out on Google Classroom or whatever. And then you're going to bring five or six kids into a breakout room with you for a targeted task that is meant to, among other things, instill what working in a smaller group looks like. And you're going to steer that ship. You're going to give some of them a task. You're going to have a targeted task that you're trying to accomplish, and then you're going to move them on. And part of that is just to get into the routine of what working in a small group looks like. So that's one way. Another way, and Malika is bringing this up right now, uh, is to, is to uh, stick to a very narrow focus. So like we're going to break you guys out, but I'm literally giving you four minutes, and I'm going to time you. You get – 240 seconds. That's it. You've got one or two very narrowly targeted things to accomplish and you're going to produce a product. So you're going to stick something in a Google slide or you're going to um, add it to a, 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 a frame of a jam board or you're going to make a contribution in the Pear Deck or, you know, however you want to organize the tool but I'm only giving you four minutes. I'm gonna break you out. I'm gonna bring you right back. And that can help too, because now there's not a lot of decision-making to do. You've sent them out with a really, really narrowly focused set of things to do. There's not a lot of guesswork and they don't have a lot of time to get off task. And then you can gauge that. If they, if they don't do anything, if you come back in four minutes and all their PowerPoint slides are empty, well then, okay, you've wasted four minutes. And it may not even have been a wasted four minutes. It just was an unproductive four minutes. And so that can be something too, that like, it could just be that the openness of it is providing lots of opportunities for student unsuredness and student self-consciousness to manifest itself in ways that a really hyper-focused opportunity would not. One of the, one of those ways I would see too is um, you we're, we're talking about small groups, but we can also have some type like a, a, a Google Doc with links to certain interest areas. You could have four different links on your Google Docs for the kids to choose and, and just tell them, go pick a link, go and do that work, and you're still there. Um, they, 
they're doing the work and then we all come back as a discussion as a whole um, to discuss what work or what video they watched or what, what things they are doing. The other thing too I wanted to is I feel like we need to honor the students or, or, or be flexible with the students that have a black screen that are uncomfortably being able to show um, show their face or their screen for whatever reason it is. Um, you still can get engagement from kids um, with examples that Andrew had just given, um, and it, uh, sending back information in a different way than just talking through um, on a screen with their face on it. Which, once again, I'm not, I'm, this isn't any kind of commentary, and I might actually get into the Zoom and edit this part out, but like you can see how, like even in our talk right now, like literally Phil and I are the only two with our cameras on. And I'm not saying that you have to change that. I mean, we're finding ways for you guys to engage the conversation without forcing that decision upon you to turn your camera on. And you don't have to, and I'm not asking you to. I'm just saying that like, we can, we can see that for some folks in some settings, in some contexts, they'd much rather play with their camera off. Maybe you're eating lunch right now and you're trying to eat chili and you're someone who puts chili on your shirt when you eat chili, you know, I don't know. You, and you don't want people watching you do that. Fair enough. <laughs> I wouldn't either. And so you're free to make that decision. Are there ways that we can present options for students to engage so that we're not forcing them to walk a path they're uncomfortable with to do it? And then once you've got the relationship established, then we can start helping some of those things that are more habit-based kind of work in more productive ways. Because there is going to be value in them being willing to turn their camera on eventually. It's just, are they willing to do it right now? And are we going to make them doing it right now a precondition to them learning our content and engaging our class? So, okay. So let's talk about the data piece. Um, I'm going to buzz through this a little bit quickly because um, we're running out of time. So, when you think of the different ways that you might consider grouping your students, the, the Grand Ledge teacher that I was talking about that I had the conversation with, um, they, for a lot of them, what they're doing is, is seemingly random grouping. But it's not truly random because it's based on schedule. Like who's able to be here at 110? Who's able to be here at 125? Who's able to be here at 140? Like that's your group. You're the 110 group. And it, you might come with three readers that are super duper strong and two that are really struggling, and that's your five. Okay, that's what we got. Now, they're observing a lot of upside to that because that peer-to-peer -peer modeling, that peer instruction, the ability to do some of that reciprocal teaching, all these other things are improved when you've got some proficiency in the group. But then you also have students who are a little bit lower in the proficiency level, but they're able to observe not only a teacher who is proficient, but other students using student language and using student um, uh, sort of the, the, the way that a student looks when they're proficient as well in a setting that is developing um, that type of growth model. So level-based grouping, interest-based grouping are different. Level-based grouping is where you group students according to where they fit in the proficiency range. So you group all the really, really proficient students and then sort of the medium proficient students and then maybe the students who are the lower on the proficiency level. Our right, interest-based grouping is, is ways of grouping students so they can self-select according to choice that they have as far as their interest levels on specific topics. So if you're giving them opportunities to explore more things, uh, they have the opportunity to choose. Uh, skill, skill or needs-based groups are generally used when you need students who have uh, instructional needs. So like if there's foundational content that you can tell they're lacking, that's getting in the way of them learning new content, maybe you create a smaller group that goes back and reteaches some of that content that, that they maybe don't have as strongly. And then random grouping is just like I was saying before, where we just throw names in a hat and we go, you, 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 and you, come here, you know? And, and like I said, there's a lot of teachers who have observed that. And this year, especially teachers who would not have been up for random grouping are using random grouping because schedule is more of an issue than it has been before. And so you're kind of getting a, a, a more random cross section of your class 
at any given moment because just those happen to be the students who are available to come at that time. So as far as the data goes, okay, so that's why we started with what's the goals that you still have. So if your goals are engagement goals, like right now, I'm observing 35% of my students regularly turning in work. Okay, that's not a very high percentage if that is the situation you're finding yourself in. Let's suppose we move to a small group structure. The goal would be initially to see more engagement as evidenced by more work being turned in completed or quality attempted at least, right? So maybe you observe, you know, you, you at the end of the week, you say what percentage of work got turned in. And it's a simple metric. Here's how much I assigned. Here's how much I turned in. Take the number, little number divided by the big number and see what you get. Okay. And then you do that again the following week and see if a second week of small groups has had a positive impact. If it's not having any impact at all after two weeks, maybe you think about restructuring it or abandoning it. If it is having a positive impact, then you're good. That's helped. Keep going. You know what I'm saying? And it's those kinds of things where we want to make sure that we're able to attach whatever goal we have for this to whatever whatever structure that we're changing and then monitor the progress of that intervention on the goal that you have. Because not every, not every first attempt is gonna be successful. And we know this to be true, right? Not every first attempt is gonna be successful. So let's assume, let's assume that it's not going to be, or ex assume that it's not guaranteed that it's going to be successful and be prepared to have to judge that. So the point that I want to make with this slide too is don't forget what you've learned um, over this online learning. And still, you still can use Google products and Google Classroom to, to help with breaking things down um, in, into smaller groups or, or trying just to, to uh, motivate or even to accommodate certain kids. This is a link to uh, a working document that I have um, as a Google Doc that has examples of uh, built-in products um, from Google and Microsoft Office and um, different YouTube links at, and reading pieces um, there's extensions for Google um, that for the Google Chrome products um, and take a look at those things and see if there's some things that may um, be helpful for you. Think of it as as something that you know you have, but you don't necessarily have to use it until you have that right kid that needs to have it. Um, so it's kind of that toolbox concept. Uh, but it's there for you. It's a resource for you to be able to um, do. And, and also, um, you want to make understand that you want to be flexible in, in your thoughts. When you UDL concept, I think when we start to talk about people get it when, when we're talking about lessons and, and, and having uh, a discussion or breaking down information for kids. But it's also part of um, taking a look at the beginning piece and the ending piece and not just the middle of what's going on. CAST is a national agency, federal agency that um, has great examples and they, they have many different projects going on right now that you can take a look at their website and see some of those things. They, um, they're in our folder, um, resource folder, we have um, examples of how you can take a look at different ways, multiple means of engagement. Um, you can take a look at different things from um, multiple means of representation and multiple means of action expression. It's just being able to break up that lesson plan, not just necessarily a technology examples, but lesson plans that can be broken up um, with, even without uh, technology. So how do we put this all together? And um, so want to make sure that you think about this as start small, try to make sure that you figure out what students you are, um, 
that you can work through some things and, and be able to start maybe with just interest groups. You know, you could look at um, different topics within a range of what your subject areas and see, and that's see where the kids gravitate to. That's part of trying to figure out who these kids are. Um, you can make a list of your students and identify some common needs and, and choices that they may, um, they could provide. You could select an activity and try make, make it an open-ended. That's, you know, a great way to, to have it be flexible. And it's amazing when you have open, open-ended activities, how much information, how much you learn from the kids that you have in your classroom. And you have to do this came up in the chat. I don't know how many of you are following the chat, but like the question of remembering that like students are going to have to buy in in order for this to be effective. And so like it's a risky decision to start out, a, you know, we're going to try this brand new structure. And we're going to bring together in small groups. And those of you who come to small groups are going to get met with 100 practice math problems like that's that's a that's a high risk move because you you want to make sure that you take the opportunity early to establish that this is a valuable, interesting, engaging place to be where we're going to engage with each other as humans. There's going to be a, a relationships that get established. You you got to kind of look at them this way early in the process so that you're able to assess needs better. You're able to get information to them and from them better. You're able to get them to engage authentically. You know, that those are the kinds of things that are when when disengagement is a problem, usually it's part of the problem, not all the problem, but part of the problem is that students don't feel particularly drawn to the classroom community. And so if you can use small groups to help establish some of that, um, there's value in that. So starting small also means don't necessarily have super huge high content goals for these things while they're in the startup phase. Like just establish the routine, the role, get a, you don't want to do some content, obviously. We're not just bringing these things together so that we don't, you know, we just talk about our favorite songs, but you, you also want to remember that students are going to want to have to, they're going to have to want to come to these things. And keep in mind tools and materials as well. We want, um, there's, there's a lot of value in you knowing what's available to you and knowing how to use it. And this gets back to the UDL dinner party kind of metaphor. You know, you, you are able to, if you, if you are, it's easier to create a dinner party that's got lots of options if you know how to make lots of different things. If I only know how to make three things, then that's fine. But those are the three things at my dinner party. That's it. It's what you're getting. You know what I'm saying? And then I, I can go to the store and buy some other things, but like the met, according to the metaphor, if Phil is able to make two or three things and I'm able to make two or three other things, then we can collaborate together and have a better dinner party than we could have if either one of us were doing it by ourselves. And so keeping in mind the tech tools you have available to you, but also staying in touch with your coaches, also staying in touch with your colleagues, stealing ideas from them, or in some cases, stealing resources and actual activities from them um, is going to be of the highest value um, as you try to build this level of flexibility into your schedule. And remembering that it's valuable for you as a teacher to have access and proficiency to using lots and lots of different things. It is not valuable as much for you to press all of those things onto your students. The reason that you have lots and lots of things that you're able to use is so that you can draw from them strategically according to what your students need. There's going to be a point at which if you oversaturate them with a variety of different tools, they're not going to be comfortable enough with any one of them to do a lot of great learning or a great engaging. You're going to max out their ability to develop that proficiency. And so you want to kind of narrow what you develop into activities to your students according to what you think you can get the highest return on investment in. So keep in mind, this whole PowerPoint slide deck has all kinds of clickable links, examples, models. Sometimes it's easier to start with a made example so that you can then tweak it according to your specific circumstances as opposed to trying to develop something from scratch. Um, all of this lesson planning ideas, UDL uh, models, 
um, all kinds of stuff. So here's the last stopping jot that we want to talk about. All right, go ahead and, and knock out on a piece of paper or type it someplace that, that you'll be able to look at. What are some things that you think you're going to actually try? Like, let's take this out of the brain space and off the screen and actually say, I'm going to try to do this for this purpose. Um, sometimes writing it down is the first step of really committing to trying to do a new thing. Um, so, yeah, go ahead and, and jot some notes if you're feeling, once again, if you're feeling gutsy and you want to share your thoughts with the world. Go ahead and type them into the chat as well. I heard you see them from Kat. Collaboration is key. It's so true. You you have so many different resources in your buildings that um, you know share those resources, share the times and um, ideas for people. Use small groups to accomplish smaller tasks and get a bigger um, to get to the bigger goal. Perhaps mix and match of only a few terms. Oh, that's true. I actually just began inviting students to afternoons for 20 minute sessions. They don't always show up. So this is very helpful for me to drill down ways to get them there. Yeah, and that's going to be part of this. I mean, we're going to have to work with imperfect launches and improve over time. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I mean, that's, Really, that's true for every implementation that we do. I mean, yeah, don't be so hard on yourself. Yeah. Okay. Well, we are running out of time here. Um, here's our contact information on the slide deck. Uh, you can get a hold of any of the four of us. I know that Heidi and Nicole were only here in spirit. Um, but you can get a hold of us. They are extremely competent educators with great coaching skills and very, very uh, warm and welcoming personalities that I think would be very, um, very good for you to, to collaborate with them. Of course, there's, there's me and Phil as well, who um, are always willing to idea build with you or um, to help get you um, a skill that maybe you think you might be missing. Um, and do reach out to us. Let us know what we can do to be helpful to you. 